recording starts. There we go. Hopefully you're in the right talk. Um, this is why bad ideas are the best ideas. So I'm not Austin Powers, as someone actually read it uh, when they saw the agenda come out. They're like, sweet, there's a talk being done by Austin Powers. They posted that on Java and then realized that I'm not Austin Powers. I am, in fact, Aaron Powell, or as people seem to only know me as that guy at the conference that's wearing the hat. Um, I know there's like one or two other people wearing a hat, so I'm no longer unique, but that's, that's how people always seem to identify me, and I do have hair. Uh, a lot of people also thought I was bald and felt sorry for me because of that. Uh, I'm Slice on Twitter, and I'm a Redify senior consultant. And I have a lot of really bad ideas, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So this isn't really a technical talk, but I'm not gonna be diving into any really hardcore code or anything like that uh, that you might find in some of the other sessions. This is more of a talk about ideas. We're talking about a bunch of different things that I've done, uh, some uh, ideas that I've had, and they're the kind of things that were bad ideas. And I don't mean bad ideas like um, going out and getting really intoxicated and then you know, falling over and waking up God knows where the next morning. I'm talking about the idea that you have as a software developer where like, you're really excited about this. You're, hey, I've got this great idea. You, like, and you, you give the spiel to someone and they give you that look. You know that look when you, that you, you've just completely lost them. They think that you have just said the dumbest thing on earth. That is the kind of ideas that I'm going to be talking about today and why those ideas are actually really, really good. So the first idea I want to talk about is dependency injection in JavaScript. Has anyone done any dependency injection in JavaScript? Like, cool, one person has done some dependency injection in JavaScript. Uh, so this came about last year, I got married. Sorry, off the market. I was expecting a bit more of a laugh than that one. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, so after, after a wedding, we did the, the normal thing, we went on our honeymoon. I wasn't gonna put a photo of that up. That would have been a bad idea and not the kind of bad idea that I'm talking about today. So instead, I had this idea, um, kind of, it was the start of last year that I got married and I had this idea that had been flying around in my head because there was this new cool JavaScript framework that was on the scene, it was called AngularJS. Anyone heard of AngularJS? Cool, yeah, was, it, and that was, I wasn't really expecting many people to have not heard of it. It's, and one of the things that was like really popular about AngularJS and it was kind of, when people from the .NET community were talking about AngularJS, they were saying, it's really cool because it's got dependency injection built in. And I'm like, uh-huh. I've been doing JavaScript for about eight, nine years now and I've never seen that as an issue. I've been doing .NET for just as long and I've used DI all the time, but I've never found it as something that I thought I've really needed inside of my JavaScript projects. It's, it's just never been a problem that I've really wanted to, to tackle and had a need to solve. But this, it just kept kicking around in the back of my head. I'm like, how are they doing it? Like, how would you do dependency injection in JavaScript? So we've got a few issues. We don't really have a type system in JavaScript. I, we, we've got a couple of primitive types, like number types and booleans and object, but that's about it. Like, we don't have classes or anything like that that we have from .NET to do you know, type resolutions. Uh, we don't really have a reflection framework. Like, at least nothing is completely complex as what we have in .NET. There's some sort of things you can do with reflection that I learned by doing this, a kind of reflection-ish in JavaScript that I learned by doing this. But it's not like the .NET APIs that we have. And we don't really have, a, well, we don't have a class system in JavaScript. It's, it's a prototypal language, so we don't have this notion of creating objects because we don't really have objects quite the same way as we do when we're approaching this kind of a problem from a .NET perspective. And that was obviously where I was coming from, a, a .NET background. So I was thinking, how, how would you tackle this? I mean, it's obviously gotta be a problem that would, like, if it was easy to solve, someone would have already solved it. If it was a useful problem to solve, more people than AngularJS would probably have solved this in the past. Like, there'd be a framework out there that you would, like, the same way as we install IOC containers through NuGet these days, we'd be doing the same thing through Bower or something like that to get it into our JavaScript projects. So why has no one done this? It seems like a reasonable idea. And as soon as you say to someone, hey, I really think a great idea is to write an IOC container in JavaScript, they're like, why? And they give you that look, that look of that I've never, that's not solving a problem I've ever had to come across. So I decided to still do it. I, I wanted to tackle this. I wanted to see what it would take to write an IOC container in JavaScript. 
So the first thing that I had to do, regular expressions. Um, this is an XKT comic uh, about yeah regular regular expressions, but that's what it was going to come down to. I'm like, well, Angular has got to be doing something magical because the way Angular works is you have to use particular names to the arguments of the functions that you're creating, and that determines what services that you're getting loaded or your factories that are getting passed in and the uh, the dependencies that are getting built up. And there's several other ways that you can do it, but that's the most basic of approaches that you've got within in Angular to do it. So I'm like, how are they doing it? It had to be regular expressions, but it still doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because you, you, you need a string, obviously, to do that. And this is kind of what it boils down to. We start off with a regular expression that I've got at the top, and that is just looking for the function keyword, uh, some white space, uh, parentheses, and then anything between the open and closed parentheses is anything that is interesting. They're the dependencies that I'd be injecting into a function within JavaScript. And the other thing I learned is that if you call toString on a function in JavaScript or a variable that has had a function assigned to it, you actually get back the full function uh, with the like, indentations and all that kind of stuff that it had when the function was created. So when it was run through the JavaScript runtime, if I was to, uh, so on the third line there of code, when I toString the add variable, I get back exactly what I have prior to that, except without the bar add equals. I just get, I get the function, I get a space, I get an open parentheses, I get an X, I get a comma, I get a Y. So if I pass that through a regular expression with a capture group on everything between the open and closed parentheses, I kind of get what I get on the, I have what I get on the bottom slide of the code. That was really badly said. Let me try again. What you get is the very last line of this code snippet so I have my initial bit, which is the, the function capture component, and then I have the capture group, which is x, comma, y. And there it is the start of our dependencies. So I can easily capture my arguments. I know what they are, and that's what AngularJS itself does. It uses a regular expression, I, unless you're using some of the other ways of doing dependency uh, injection in Angular for, that I'm not going to touch on for this uh, idea. But they use a regular expression, they capture that, and that's why it's able to pull out dollars HTTP, and that is to the HTTP service. Because we can then just split that uh, one long string of arguments by the comma, remove white space, and now we have an array of arguments that is passed into that function, the names of those uh, variables that the function is going to be using them as, which we can then load into an IOC container that we have, which is really just a big hash at the end of the day is our IOC container. So if I have a hash bag that I create a property on there that has the name of X, I can then look at my IOC container, find the X property, and then pass that in as an argument to my function. And that's really what it comes down to, is regular expressions. This wasn't a particularly interesting project to ultimately do, but I, I was like, I really just want to write this code because they've been floating around in the back of my head. And I sat down on my honeymoon, and this is kind of why it was a bad idea. And I wrote a little library, it's called AutoFact.js, that I chucked up on GitHub just because I wanted to see how it could be done. I wrote a bunch of unit tests and threw it up on GitHub and have not touched the code in over 12 months because I just wanted to see that idea come to fruition. I just wanted to see how the code would work. And I wanted to see what the end result could be of something as simple as an IOC container written in JavaScript. So I mean, why was this really a bad idea? I mean, it, it could be kind of useful. I mean, someone might actually want to use AutoFact.js. I don't think anyone has ever used it. Please don't use it. Don't use this stuff in production. That's another takeaway from this talk. All the code I'm talking about today, it's not the kind of code you're ever going to want to deploy in production. It's slow, it's not solving really useful problems. If you need IOC in, in JavaScript, go to Angular. It's been done a much better way than something as simple as this. But really, it just it's not solving a problem that we really come across that frequently in JavaScript. There's better ways of doing dependency management, something like RequireJS to make sure that we have our modules loaded. Because this is not dealing with the complex nature of how do we get those functions or those variables loaded into the system. We still don't have a type system, so we're just kind of doing things on loose strings. And that's what I sort of learned, is that you, you have all these loose strings, and that's why you've got to make sure your variable names are exactly correct, and you can get runtime errors if you don't have them correct. Another bad idea is writing code while you're on your honeymoon. Yeah, that's that's one that I'm going to be paying for for a while, I think. But from the aspect of this being a good idea, why I think that it was really a valuable exercise is that I, 
I've done a lot of JavaScript talks over the years. I've spoken here at DDD a couple of times in the past on JavaScript. But there's always more things to learn. I, I didn't know that second point there where if you've got a function, uh, be it assigned to a variable or just a, a function uh, name or uh, even a function expression like I've got here, if you call dot length on that, that is the number of arguments that that function has. So in this simple example here, it's got a length of one because it's got one argument that's been passed into that. So you, that's a kind of a simple aspect of a reflection API. You can work out how many arguments that you would have being passed to a function. And also, this is why in AngularJS, uh, if you're going to run it through a minifier, you're recommended to use a completely different way of doing dependency management. You create an array and the first, uh, everything up until the, um, the last argument is a string which represents the name of the uh, the service that you want to resolve. Because as soon as you put this through a minifier, it's no longer going to be called $HTTP. It's going to be called X or Z or A or something completely randomly named. And that's not going to be useful for your IFC container. So that's, that was a bunch of things that I learned that I found very valuable kind of going forward just from a pure JavaScript development perspective. Not necessarily from, I want to write more IFC based. JavaScript. So the next bad idea I want to talk about is things you can do with the Git object model. So last year I had this uh, desire to understand Git a lot better. I, I use it day to day um, with work and stuff like that, but I never like, really understood what happens at the low levels of, of Git. I, I, I like to understand what things are, are doing kind of under the hood behind these commands that we're typing in and, and magic happens and then all of a sudden I have source Something like that happens. So I wanted to understand exactly what's happening through the Git object model. So Git turns out it's really simple. It's actually basically a file system. Uh, it's, a, it's a very simple version of a Linux file system. It has blobs. So a blob is like your code or the contents of a file that's being stored. So it could be a binary if you're putting binaries in source. And that's a different kind of bad idea that, again, it's not the sort of bad idea that I'm promoting in this talk. But so you've got these blobs. Blobs are then assigned to trees. Trees are synonymous with your folders. And your, your, so your folder structure is a series of trees inside of the Git object model. And then you have a commit. A commit contains multiple trees, which then in turn can contain multiple blobs. But the really interesting thing is that a tree and a blob can exist in multiple commits. This is how Git uh, doesn't need to create a full clone of everything that's being committed every single time it goes into uh, every time you commit something into a repository, it will uh, it will actually find the, like the previous versions of it, and then just like it hangs on to those previous trees and blobs, and then just changes the pointers to them. So because it, it's like a file system, it's just changing pointers with inside of itself, and that's how checkouts can be um, and changing branches and stuff can be really fast because it's just changing pointers on a file system. So I had this idea: Let's start with a really simple board game. Tic-tac-toe. We all know how this can play out. We have X and O and they play their various moves. And this is a, obviously a game where X has won. Uh, X has started off, they've played a series of moves. I always tried to uh, intercept them and block the potential winning moves that they're making, but ultimately they have still lost and X has come triumphantly round the room screaming at the top of their lungs like they've won the World Cup because Tic-Tac-Toe is just that hardcore a game. But how do, like, let's just think about how this game could have started. So we have an initial board state. Looks like this. So we've got uh, some, some form of initialization to start with. We play a move. X puts something in the upper left-hand corner, and the board is now set. So that's what we've got at that particular point in time. That's how the board will always look. O plays their move. Board is locked at that point. X plays another move. O plays another move to block the potential winning move. X plays another move. Now we have a position where there is no, well, within kind of any sort of logical approach, there is no way that X can't win. I mean, X can actually play a bunch of really stupid moves and not win the game. Uh, but unless you've written a really terrible AI, it's probably going to win at this point. So let's break that down again to the steps that happened. We had an initial game state. Hit in it git commit at an empty repository. We made a change to that repository, and we locked it at that particular point. X, made, X played their move, we commit, X move. 
then O move, rinse and repeat. And then we get to the final point where we had. So we had all these individual, we could have all these individual commits that represent the state of the game. Each commit has its own blob because there's only a finite amount of places that things can happen with inside of this board. There's, uh, these are stats from Wikipedia. I'm pretty sure they're correct. I didn't actually sit down and play 255,000 games of tic-tac-toe to make sure that this did math check out. This did math check out. Whoa, I am on a roll today. But in theory, that there is 255 potential uh, game states that can happen from a tic-tac-toe game. Uh, of that, 131,000 times uh, X is going to win, O is going to win uh, 77,000 times, and there can be 46,000 potential draw states. But really, there's actually a much smaller number of moves that can happen within a board. There is 19,683 uh, 19, potential combinations of board state. So this is uh, three to the power of nine, because it's three, uh, nine, and I know I saw that off Wikipedia, but that's the that's the number of potential states. So that's a very small number of different blobs, and the way we get there is just different trees and different commits, at least in theory. Now you're getting the same look that I you're giving me the same look that I generally get when I tell people that you could do this, that you could represent every potential outcome of a tic tac toe game using the Git object model because it's only nineteen thousand blobs which is not that particularly large in terms of source code. I'm currently working on a repository that's got something in the vicinity of 40,000 unique files. So that, this is not that large a repository, really. So I wrote a little bit of code. Um, this is a, a really ugly bunch of uh, Git combined with uh, like Unix Git combined with PowerShell. I got chastised by a PowerShell friend of mine for doing that. He's like, you just do that all in PowerShell. I'm like, no, but I wanted to use sed and grep and stuff like that. And what I, what I learned from this is that I, I never really sat down and played with some of the way, uh, some of the really strange uh, commands that you can run from Git, or not, not strange, but less common commands you can run from Git. Something like ls tree. So uh, I guess to explain what this code is doing, um, what it does is add a commit, it does uh, a log and finds the, um, the current commit's hash, and then takes that hash, looks through the entire Git repository at every other hash that has ever happened in there, see if there's anything that also matches that. If there is something that matches that, it will then see if that was from a winning game. Uh, so that's on the third line. It does, uh, it does a, a search through all the Git tags for a winning game. Uh, and then we'll list out all the potential winning games that could come from the current game state that you're at. So that this move that you've had, is there another game that has previously had this move and what was the outcome of that? So you could, in theory, write a little bit of AI that runs this code, plays a move, looks to see in its history, did someone else play this move and what was the outcome of that game? Ooh, I didn't actually like that outcome. I'm going to play a different move next and change the way the game runs based off of previous executions, all using a combination of walking the object model, uh, some more regexes. This talk has got a lot of good regexes in it. And again, that's kind of I guess in the theme of bad ideas uh, that we're, we're talking regexes. And finally, just doing a couple of simple loops over the outcome of that. For the record, I actually haven't implemented tic-tac-toe fully on top of the Git object model and have AIs com uh, competing against each other. The original idea I had for this was chess. Chess has a lot more potential game states. Uh, and it would probably be a stretch to try and fit that in uh, a Git object model. Uh, and it would be a really bad idea. So um, why would this be considered a bad idea? Uh, other than the fact that I'm getting a lot of, uh, lot of blank stares at me at the moment of thinking, why on earth would you potentially want to do this? This seems like a very crazy uh, idea. It's also, it's just a really bad abuse of something like the Git object model. I mean, it, it's just a file system. So we're just moving bits around on a file system. But file systems really aren't designed to be used in this way. But what I found was really useful is I never had an appreciation for the power of the Unix commands like grep and sed and how you can combine them with something like the Git output to really quickly filter down uh, 
the information that you're working with. Um, I've been, this project that I'm currently working on that has quite a large uh, repository. Um, we happen to store binary files in there and they're the output of a build process and oftentimes we're getting merge conflicts because it's very difficult to merge a binary file. So we end up with these merge conflicts and I really wanted, like, it was really getting tiring to have like 40 files listed out and then copy and paste each file name and do um, git checkout theirs and, and kind of resolve this um, merge conflict. But with something like grep and sed, I could write a little reg regular expression that would find the errors, uh, find the merge conflicts on these binary files. So things that I wasn't actually gonna be able to merge myself anyway in any kind of uh, diff tool. Pass that through to another simple command that would then um, just execute a while loop on top of that and do the checkout on them for me. So just a couple of simple regular expressions and uh, these commands meant that I'd, I'd saved a good couple of minutes every kind of time I was doing a, a merge from uh, our remote branches because I didn't have to keep copying and pasting all these file names. But I'd never really appreciated the power that these commands could give me until I decided to do something completely wild and out there, like look at how you could build a game on top of a Git object model. It also gave me a chance to play around with some of the lesser known Git commands. I understand what things like lstree does or how you could find, based off of the current hash that you've got, what, um, like what its parents are and how you can manipulate those um, directly and indirectly just by kind of moving pointers around in the Git object model. Because as I said, it's a file system, so it's, it's really easy to do this kind of simple manipulation. And that's actually a very easy way that you can do some history rewriting. You, every time you do a merge between branches, it just kind of changes a couple of pointers on there, uh, changing those pointers uh, between the parents of the objects, or the parents of the commits, and you end up with different commits, different branches, and the old ones are just, they're just hashes that still hang around until they get removed. It was really interesting to understand the, the, these low level features of something that I just kind of took for granted as a, as a tool of my trade. So the last bad idea I want to touch on is math. Yep, yep. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be a math talk now. So I implemented my own number system. Has anyone implemented their own number system in a programming language? Nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, so. So there is one person that is going to appreciate just how crazy an idea it is to kind of try and write maths from scratch. Because yeah, I, so the starting for this bad idea was I was at JSConf uh, in Melbourne back in April and a guy gave this talk on a, a stream of mathematics uh, called surreal, uh, surreal Mathematics or Surreal Numbers. And it's a way of representing numbers but not necessarily representing them the way that we represent them at the moment. So we know we have this like straight line and that represents the number one. We have this kind of thing that's got a bit of a hook at the top and then a straight line across the bottom and that represents the number two. But really, do those numbers exist? Like, have you ever stopped to think about like, if there weren't people, would there still be the number three? No one's thought about that. It's probably a good reason for not thinking about that. It's it's kind of out there, sort of sort of thinking of, of what uh, what we're generally doing, with, particularly in software. But that's what this talk was about: was, um, was thinking abstractly about maths and numbers, and then he wrote his own number system using surreal numbers as the base of that for uh, what he was uh, what he was illustrating as the the uh, finite points of the talk. So surreal numbers kind of looks like this, but like realistically, this could be any sort of fake version of math that I'm working with. So I've got something that, I mean, it's equivalent to uh, the number of zero. So I represent that by uh, an open square bracket, uh, open square bracket, a closed square bracket, a comma, et cetera, et cetera. And then to represent the number one, I just have something that looks slightly different. So I have what is number zero, but I then have something else just to the right hand side of that. To represent negative one, I have it to the left hand side of that. To represent uh, positive two, I would then uh, have 
the number one and then have something to the left hand side of that, so on and so forth. So you end up with this, this a mess of square brackets. But still, this is, this is my own way of representing these things that we have uh, Roman, are they Roman characters? I'm not sure, I'm not a language person, but we have these characters that represent these things that we call one, two, three, fifty, etc. So, as soon as you start writing your own number system, you find that you've got some interesting problems to solve. Like, how do you actually start adding these things together? I mean, it's really cool that I can say, hey, look, I've got something that looks like zero, I've got something that looks like one, and now how do I make them like join together to make an incrementation of those? So if I take two things that look like one, how do I make them look like two? So that's that was the next logical step. Yeah, yeah logical step, right? I, I'm writing my own number system. The next logical step was going to have to be to implement elementary arithmetic. So one plus one, we know that that equals two. We know that. If we take a negative number and we subtract a number from it, we know that becomes a positive number. If I take two numbers and multiply them together, I end up with a, a number. Or if I take a negative number, divide it by a positive number, or vice versa, we end up with an output of that. And we've got all these things. We know how the numbers are supposed to work. We know what division does, don't we? We know exactly what's happening when you divide 6 by negative 3. We know that that equals negative 2. But I had this question. What's it actually doing? Like if I had a pile of six rocks and a pile of negative three rocks, yeah. <laughs> Think about that one for a second. And then I wanted to divide them. Like, hmm, what, what am I actually doing to these piles of rocks to divide them down to end up with a negative two at the end? Or let's just go six divided by two and end up with uh, well, 6 divided by 3 will end up with positive 2 because that's a lot easier to visualize from this imaginary pile of rocks that I've got sitting in front of me on the floor here. Or visualizing this imaginary pile of rocks that we're going to divide and yeah. Okay, so we take elementary arithmetic for granted, right? We know how it works. But I, I, I never sat down and thought, really, what are we doing under the hood? So I really wanted to understand how the hell this thing actually worked. What actually happens when I add two numbers together or when I multiply two numbers together? So here is a very simple bit of code that implements division. Um, it, it, this is still using the numerical representations that we uh, have of numbers, but I've re-implemented the divide character as my own function called divide. So I have my numerator. If it's greater than zero, I don't have um, uh, zero, uh, zero checking on the bottom here. Uh, so yes, we can get errors still if we if we run this. Um, so yeah, while we have a numerator that is greater than zero, we find the remainder, which is the numerator minus the denominator. And if the remainder is less than zero, then the remainder is actually what the denominator now is, because the denominator is the, the, that part that we had left over, or the and and that becomes the remainder. And then we have our quotient, that, which is what we keep um, incrementing. So basically, this is a while loop with an, uh, a subtraction. So uh, as we can see, um, the remainder we keep subtracting from, and then the remainder eventually becomes the numerator. And by the end of that, we end up with something that is returned. We have our quotient, which is our output value, and we have our remainder, so 0 or a value other than 0. So, um, uh, 6 divided by 3 will have a quotient of 2 and a remainder of 0. Whereas uh, 5 divided by 2 is going to give me something that I'm not going to bother doing the math on. 2.5? No, wait. Moving on! <laughs> I didn't say I actually learnt maths doing this, I just learnt how math worked. But as I said, we've still got this kind of limitation here that I'm doing a whole bunch of checks against these numerical representations of zero and other values that I've got built into my programming language um, as it is. This, is. this is written in JavaScript, as you've probably already guessed. So I sat down and decided that I wanted to write this completely without having any numbers that were like from the programming language that I was working with. So I ended up with something a bit more like this. So I used .NET for this. I decided to 
um, completely like write it from scratch in .NET because uh, that way I get cool things like operator overloading, which we don't have in JavaScript. Uh, so I can do cool things like overload the, the division operator. So we do the first thing is if uh, B is zero, so I have a function that determines um, whether or not something can be uh, is is my representation of zero, and if it is zero, then it's the divide by zero exception. So throw that out. Uh, if the um, the numerator is also zero or is zero as well, then it's always going to end up as zero. We we always end up with zero with zero divided by something. So there's no point in going through our looping process. We just can like straight return our representation of zero. And then I start doing the same things that I had previously of um, checking where things lie with inside of my number system. So this is also doing things like determining whether or not things are positive or negative. So uh, you do different things at a mathematical level if a number is a positive number versus a negative number in uh, terms of division and multiplication, addition and subtraction. So if it's a positive, um, so if the denominator is a positive number, while the numerator is still a positive number, we then subtract the uh, numerator from the denominator and then we iterate again through that loop. So we, we basically just increment our quotient value. So that's what division comes down to. Division is a check until we, uh, it's a check until we hit zero from our numerator while we keep subtracting the denominator from it. And the number of times we perform that loop is the quotient value that we end up with. The other thing that I learned from that is why we end up with a divide by zero exception. So if I've got five divided by zero, that becomes five minus zero, which becomes five, which means I end up back at the start of my loop, which becomes five minus zero, which ends up at the start of the loop. And I keep going and going and going, and I actually never get anywhere. It's always going to keep being the value of the numerator, so I end up in an infinite loop. So I have the different I'm not a mathematician or anything like that, so if there is any people that are like really hardcore into their maths, they're probably going to not like what uh, I'm probably saying things are all wrong. But for, for me, it makes sense to think of zero, like the reason you can't divide by zero is because it's there's no value that can represent the outcome of that. You're always going to end up, like it just keeps in an infinite loop essentially. You can never get there. So it's, it's infinity, but it's not infinity at the same time because you can never get there. There's no way that you could ever represent the value that you would get by dividing by zero. After all that process, and there's other things that we do obviously to, to represent multiplication or subtraction and addition, et cetera, et cetera. And the way we increment, decrement, check positive, negative, how do I determine if one value is greater than another value? And it turns out that to do greater than uh, and less than and equality statements, that all comes down to, well, a, a number is greater than another number if it is not less than or equal to it. And then it is not less than that number if it, uh, so it's, and then it's not greater than or equal to that number if it is not less than that number. So basically, like all greater than and equal to's all can be represented by just implementing one single function and just using different combinations of greater than and less than, uh, less than checks to work out whereabouts that number sits in relation to other numbers in your system. So at the end of this process, oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot I had a slide about explaining divide by zero. So yeah, so it's like divide by zero, nothing more than looping until we get to thing, which is why we always end up with divide by zero at the end. So at the end of that, I have an animated GIF that is not currently running, which would have been the guy going, and that would have been so much cooler if my GIF was working. Sigh. Okay, well, moving on from that sad point. So, why is it a bad idea to implement your own number system in a programming language? Anyone take a guess at that without reading my slides, which you've probably already done? Yeah, it turns out that computers are really efficient at numbers. Like, shocking, right? I, I actually took this library of mine. Um, so, the, kind of the cool thing about writing your own number system is you're not constrained by things like int.maxValue in .NET. So I can take in.maxValue and plus in.maxValue to it, and I can get the result of that. But the problem with that is it's really slow. I, I left this running on my machine. I actually tried to plus one to in.maxValue. Uh, after about six hours, I decided I wanted my CPU back. Um, yeah, so it's not particularly efficient. I, yeah, computers are really efficient at calculating numbers at doing maths. 
don't need to write your own maths for at least elementary arithmetic. Really, don't write your own maths. Computers can do that for us. But at the end of the day, I was really excited because I really understood what was happening. Like I, I finally got what happened when I divided by numbers or when I multiplied by numbers together. That it really just came down to plus one or minus one and different ways of getting to that point, depending on whether we've got a positive value or a negative value to start with, whether we're uh, wanting to divide or multiply and we end up with just different combinations of loops and plus and minus one. That's really all that math comes down to. Again, mind blown in the animated GIF that doesn't work. Sigh. So, at the end of the day, I've just talked about three things that would probably seem like really bad ideas. In running your own IAC container in JavaScript, due to dependency injection, it's not really going to be particularly useful to anyone. But it's a, it was really a good exercise for me to understand that you can do things with regular expressions that are really, like, really quite powerful to extract parts of, of, of a function in JavaScript that I had no idea that you could actually get to. I thought that that had been, I, that kind of stuff was just not available. Um, also, probably don't write code on your honeymoon. Just gonna put that one out there. But we probably knew that was a bad idea to start with anyway. At the end of the day, you get object model. That's really just a simple file system or almost a database. You can do a whole bunch of things like, that really abuse the concept of it being just a database because we've just got objects that have keys to tr right? objects that point to trees, which are essentially keys to each other, and that we can have that blob on that tree. They can exist across multiple commits, so we could represent something as crazy as every potential outcome of a board game using different combinations of branches and just the way we wire up the tree structure and the commit structure with inside of our Git database or our Git um, object model. But you probably shouldn't do something like that because really you're abusing the wrong technology to represent every finite state of a tic-tac-toe game or chess or monopoly. And from a math perspective, we learned that it really just breaks down to plus or minus one from different sides of the number that we started with that we can uh, the, uh, then on top of that we just start building loops and the more loops that we do we represent different kinds of things um, I was really hoping to work out uh, be able to properly work out and explain how you do things like to the power of and how you then do a square root but when you're writing your own number system from scratch writing a, like, a, a root a square root or even a random power of root that's, that was starting to make my mind really hurt. And it was no longer just a bad idea for the sake of doing a bad idea. I was now beyond the realms of kind of saving. But really, don't write your own math system. Like, computers can do that pretty well for you. Thank you. That's all I had time for today. <laughs> Questions, comments, or bad ideas? Um, have I ever regretted writing something that is a bad idea? Um, I, I probably regret at least thinking about writing a chess game built on the Git object model. That's luckily I never actually went down the path of doing that. Um, but no, uh, how, how do you decide? Like, how do you weigh up the pros and cons of doing something? Um, that obviously comes down to each individual person and what their motivations are. For me, I really like to understand how something works at its core. And that's a lot of what these ideas have come from is that I've seen something and it works, it works really well, but I don't know why it works. Um, there was a, an entire other section of this talk where um, I had this little hand generator and uh, it was from an old telephone and I would wind it and 
uh, like put the ends near each other and I get like there'd be a spark between them you'd hold on to them and like you'd get electrocuted or if you like put them really close to each other uh, like if you held them between two fingers like, the the shock would be more intense or if you connected the wires together and started winding it would become really difficult to wind because that's where electrical resistance starts coming in because you're, you're creating a feedback loop uh, so I I just like to work out why is that doing what it's doing and yeah most of these things it's I'll be sitting on the couch watching TV and I'm, I'm probably not really paying a whole lot of attention to either of the things that I'm doing. Uh, it's just more an excuse to get something out of my brain that um, I've it's just been rolling around there for a while. I just want to understand why is it that the way that it is. And that, yeah, uh, the example of um, autofact.js, that had been rolling around in my brain for a couple months. And I sat down and in about two hours just wrote this thing and pushed it to GitHub and that was the last I ever saw of it basically and I don't it's not something that I've ever gone back to the core concept but it's more about what the learning outcomes from it are what can you see as being potential outcomes of interest for you I've, it's very interesting to understand how the git object model works I find that very valuable for like for working because I, I can I know how to get myself out of trouble with git a lot better than when I first started with it, because I understand more about what's happening at the very low levels. And that answer your question? Good. Yep. So it seems that that only is open because it runs. That's. So you're getting a big runs. Pretty much, yes. Does that mean that you can measure how bad it might be? Is any of the ignorance you have? Uh, yeah, you can probably. That's probably a good way of putting it. That yeah, the, the the more ignorant you were going into it, the worse the idea probably was. But you're probably getting an even better outcome because you're learning a whole lot more about it. And yeah, uh, so this is kind of the the idea of that fear of failure that you shouldn't do something, uh, you shouldn't avoid doing something because you're worried that you're not going to do it as well as you could. You're not going to succeed at the end of the day. This code is never going to make me millions of dollars. It's never going to be put into a production application or anything like that. But it's the kind of thing that, at the, yeah, at the end of the day, you're like, I'm, I've learned something. And that's, yeah, knowledge is, I find, really valuable. And, and to me, I find knowledge a lot more valuable than just the monetary returns that I could get from, from writing something that yeah, might be interesting in another, in another way. Any other questions? Yep. Any other questions, or should we wander off to the next sessions? Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference. And I forgot to put the sponsor slide up. No one told Lars that I forgot to put the sponsor slide up. It's up now. Thank you to all our awesome sponsors. <laughs>